Hi guys, welcome to another episode of The Shift with Elena Agar. I talk with Olga Feingold in this episode. We talk around leadership development, talent development, future of work, uh, future of organizations. We really touch base on so many different topics because that is her essentially background. She's really passionate about talent development and leadership development and what can we do as individuals to be better and grow and continue to be competitive in our fields and also what can organizations and leaders and organizations do to make sure their talent stays up to date. So uh, if you're interested in these topics, and I think everybody should be, especially if you're in a corporate world around leadership development, this episode is definitely for you. So check it out. Olga, welcome to the Shift Podcast. Super excited to chat with you. Thank you. So happy to be here. So with your expertise in coaching and training and strategy and all these different things that, that you do within your world, what advice would you offer to somebody, like an individual who would, would like to proactively drive that personal and professional development? Like how do you, where, where does one start if they want to continue to develop as an individual? Yeah, in this, in this space or in general? In general. Oh, I think it's great. You know, in general, I think you have to find where you're going. So I once coached a really young employee, you know, early in her career, and she was so frustrated she said, her manager's not developing her. And I said, okay, well, where do you want to go? She said, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, that's the goal then, right? And that's the goal you need to share with your manager that you want to develop your career and you're not quite sure where is best. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the missing link. Managers will often, you know, you have to think about your network, right? They can only help you if you have clarity in where you're going. Right. And if the goal is to get clarity, that's an okay goal, but then you need to state that, right? So over the next year, I want to explore uh, things that I really like doing and things that uh, I don't like doing. And so there's a, there's a lot of different exercises out there. I think there's, uh, there's a great book. I can't remember it right now, but it's uh, by it's two, two guys from Google. And it's like, own your life or work, own your work. And they, they have some exercises around, and it's simple. You could do it yourself. You know, go through your day and just write what gives you energy and put a plus next to it. And what drains your energy and put a minus. And so start to get clarity on, things that energize you, because that's where you're going to want to go. You're going to want to cultivate your career around things that you get excited. You want to spend your day doing. Mm. That, that That's an excellent point. And I think that's also like the hardest thing for people to do it. And, uh, you know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. My gut feeling is that we just don't apply enough creativity to our careers. Mm -hmm. We're so stuck. So when you're talking about like, just focus on what drains your energy, what gives you energy, it's like, okay, I did that. But then like, what do I do with that? And I feel like people get stuck because they're yeah. like, well, how do I then make this thing that I like do into a career? And I feel like it's limited in creativity. Any any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it's great. Again, I'm like pitching this book right now. I'll have to get you the title. Uh, but it's, they have this exercise that I did a few times in my career. It's super fun. And it says, just create three ideal lives, not work, just three mm -hmm. totally different ideal lives and build a 20 year plan. Like fully, they have to be different. There can be no overlap. And I think that unlocks that idea of like, I think a lot of us feel pressure. We feel pressure when we're younger. We feel pressure by society at different stages to have it figured out, whatever it is. And so that really, I think, allows you to just, it's a play activity, right? And I agree with you. There's not enough play in life. Like I don't, I have a three-year-old. I'm like, what happens to us right. that we just stop playing? You know, and I think some people don't. And those are usually entrepreneurs, right? You see them, they have a lot of fun. They're playing yeah. outside the lines of life. But for most people, they seem really afraid to play and experiment. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, it's a, speaking of kids. So uh, something I was reading recently and they say, well, you're a mom. Let me ask you, um, <laughs> how, ma how many questions on average do you think your daughter, like a kid asks oh. on a daily basis? Hmm. There was a phase where there was a lot of questions. So maybe yeah. it's coming again soon. <laughs> yeah. well, like on average, how many questions do you think people or kids ask? Kids ask? I'm, yeah. I guess it's probably like maybe 100,000. Like a hundred to a thousand. Like I know that's yeah, a lot range, but is it somewhere yeah. in there? It says like 300 a day. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and then an adult then asks 20 mm. to 30 a day. Mm. And it's, it's because it's like you, we grew like, right. Like it's interesting because it's like, we grew up so curious and at some yeah. point we stop asking questions. You know, I wonder in that research, if they were choosing an industry mm. uh, in my career, something I've observed is more corporate leaders there's, there's a lot of pressure to look like an expert. And I had the immense privilege of working with uh, the Lawrence Hall of Science and their education team at some point in my career. And I, I immediately observed 
their language was always hesitant and they were always asking questions, hmm, that's right? And it was about scientific rigor. And so that's, it's like, even if you're in pharma, that's still corporate, right? I'm talking right, about right. true scientific rigor, people who approach it from a scientific lens, because what do scientists or researchers learn that they're never, that research changes, what we know is facts changes, hmm. right? I'm just learning there's a whole, there's, you know, do you know that there's no such thing as a bronchosaurus? What? Our generation learned that that's like one of the 12 dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, it's not true anymore. There's two dinosaurs and I don't remember their names, but this is an 11 year old. My nephew told me this and I was like, wow, I think this <laughs> is like everything is, you know, our world, right? Like Pluto right. was when we were kids, like there's, yeah. yeah so I, I do think I'm curious that research, which, uh, which industry. It was yeah. In. I don't remember off the top of my head now, but uh, I need to dig that up. That'll be interesting. I'll share it in the show notes along with that book. Once we, yeah, we yeah. get the name for it. Um, no, that's super interesting. And, you know, and then going back to like the manager conversation, I think this is where, again, like, you know, obviously you and I are biased. We're in this field, but there's really some value to having managers act as coaches because you're not always going to have an employee who is like, I don't, you know, know what they want to do. And that's where the question comes in. Like the manager has to put on a coaching hat and kind of lead that discussion. Do, that is, you see that, that is like your... a soapbox yeah. I will die on right now. That's all I want to <laughs> talk about. It's do all it. I want to build. You know, I like this is, it. it is the most important skill. And I think it's finally, it, you're, we're seeing it more and more, I would say mm. over the last, you know, maybe six to nine months being discussed at scale. And, you know, it's, I, I know a lot of tech companies like Salesforce, they create internal coaches, right. And they actually go for their coaching certificate. But I think even more than that, and you're right, it's maybe we're using the wrong word, right. A lot of the industry term is coaches, but I feel like it's really training managers uh, to inquire, to be more yeah. curious. Right. But then you have the, well, okay. What, what do you say to, because this is something I struggle. What do you say to the manager says, I don't have time. Oh, yeah, I, I would say to them time, time for what, because if you're not asking those questions, you have a disengaged employee, right? And I think it's, might, it might be 23% of all employees are engaged, disengaged right now, right? So at any one point, you are going to have a disengaged employee. If you don't have time, they're not productive, which impacts you as a manager, which impacts your company, which impacts whether or not you're going to have layoffs, whether or not you're going to make revenue, right? Uh, you could have a disengaged employee who leaves then you don't, you wouldn't know. And then now let's talk about that opportunity cost, right? The cost to hire the time wasted again, low productivity, that's going to disengage the rest of your team. Mm -hmm. So I, when they say, I don't have time, I think it's a mind. It's a real, it is, it's hard. It's, I mean, I get it. Like it's really hard to be a people leader right now. And oh. there's a lot of pressure and people haven't learned how to go back to the office. So people are now overstressed and zoom calls, even when they're in person and yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I hear that. I just, you know, I'm always like, look, the research shows that's just not accurate. And, yeah. you know, I think it's, is it Peter Drucker who has, he has a quote that says 90 minutes of time with your direct will pay like dividends hmm. in your company's progress. Hmm. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's something like, I mean, I, I work in tech and I mean, we're, we're both in tech industry and it's, um, it's definitely fast paced. Yeah. But, but I just, you know, and I get it. It's gotten harder. Like I'm super empathetic to people leaders, but to your point, you just don't have a choice. It's going to become more and more important for you to make that time. And yeah. I think part of it is because people that like, go in the same routines and habits and then like in the way they work. And if, unless there's a culture in an org, like a coaching culture, I think that's, yeah. that's a big part of it. Right. And that's the, that's what people struggle with. It's the having that culture. You know, I, I, I think you'd hit the nail on the head. And I, at least, it, you know, what I've seen is that uh, people who live in cultures that say, I don't have time, the best people leaders, they are making the time, mm -hmm. right? I and mean, we just had end of month close at, at where I work. And we, I had a VP reach out to me end of month close with his SVP on the call to talk about a people leadership challenge they're having. And simply to get my perspective on what we could do, what are the tools and resources we could offer their frontline manager. And I'm always like the people who are out there, who are killing it, who are hitting their number, who are driving productivity. When you actually look at their calendar, they have a lot of time that they're meeting with their people. Hmm. And this is like a little back end secret because I, I was working on a project around manager enablement last year. 
And part of that was I asked, I went and I, I asked a couple of people leaders who are really great. They're well-known to deliver results and be a good people manager. And I said, can I just, can you take a screenshot of your calendar? I'm not going to share it with anyone else. This is 100% safe. If there's something personal or networking, like feel free to, you know, read it out or put busy. But I, I really want to understand how great managers are spending their time. And at the same time, Gardner had just released this, you know, map of how great uh, sales managers specifically spend their time. And it was really interesting because Gardner's is, it's always a little bit too meta for the frontline manager, right? Shows percentage of time, which is really hard when you're busy and you're stressed. And this is not what you think about all day long to think, how would that look like in a calendar? And I looked across these people leaders calendars, and I will tell you, all of them are spending five hours a week coaching. They're all having one hour, one-on-one. -on -one. Someone was like, what, what do I, how do I have a one hour, one-on-one? -on -one? I'm like, you just do, right? And you prioritize it and you don't cut it out. And I think that your point around culture is, I I would bet none of those leaders would feel comfortable sharing that calendar out publicly with their colleagues, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's because this culture, we have to seem like, oh no, I'm busy, I'm doing things. Like that is what they're doing and right. they are driving results. So to your point, I think it is like, how do we get the culture to talk about, no, I spend a significant amount of my work time asking questions, inquiring, understanding what's happening on the front lines. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think just it's not giving as much of a priority. So I can see how as a leader, you're like, well, and if you don't, if the culture doesn't support it and you're the only one doing it, then your boss, you know, and the boss of boss is going to be like, why are you, why are you just spending time with your team if they don't see an impact yeah. of it, you know? But you yeah, know, yeah. that's, yeah. well, I'll tell you, I think that, yeah, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. I'm just thinking of a leader who, mm -hmm you know, talked all the right things, but they had never hit the number. And so I, it is a, it is really tough, right? Because it's like yeah. some people can really talk the talk, but then the skills aren't there underneath, you know? Yeah. 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 No, it's, um, it, it's interesting. And, and what's, what's interesting is that I wonder how much of it is going to continue to almost get worse, not to be pessimistic, but if you think about it, uh, you have Gen Z's coming into the workforce, right? And they tend to, the loyalty is just not the world of work is changing like no, gone yeah. are the days where you're staying five ten years at a company so and i wonder if part of it is also like the buy-in managers have like do i really want to invest in my team members like i'm only going to be here for two three years so maybe they're just trying mm -hmm. to like so not really proactive then i like listen like i just want to get my i just want to get my team to do things get things done so no more of a managing the person versus leading the person so to say i guess and um and maybe they just want to get things done. And they're like, listen, I'm going to be here for two years. Let me just maximize on the profits. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if that means my team is going to be burnt out, even if that means there's going to be a big rotation because I'm going to be gone anyway. And I wonder if that mentality is also there. You know what I mean? With yeah, it's a good call out. No. Yeah, I wonder, I, I'd be curious. I wonder if there's any research that you and I could look no. at, data trending. At, at least anecdotally, what I've seen is this next generation cares more. Mm -hmm. Right. I think they, this is, they really understood that this is their network short-term or long-term. And I think because they switch so much, it, I imagine that they would have to have a more robust network, right. Mm -hmm. To be able to pivot. Cause, and this might be like a lesson coming to them, but you know, I, I think it surprised me. I mean, people told me about it. But I think it surprised me at this level that it really is all about the network and how I see the same people at different companies. Right. And I, even my loose ties, like I see them kind of paralleling similar industries I feel like when you're younger you go to different kind of careers and industries but then you start to find your niche and then you see the same people kind of in that space for a while hmm. so I don't know I feel like they those people will be with them one way or another but it's yeah. a good point to if that's one of the contributing challenges yeah I, I just see this quite a bit in, in, in some some tech fields at least because it's like it's such a high turnover in a lot of places yeah. in general so it's like I think it's just an additional thing that a lot of tech managers have to do, right? And it's like, it's almost like it's already a lot. And then you're asking me to do this and you want me to rearrange the whole thing and, and I'm going to be gone like a year or two years. I, that's, it's just mm -hmm. my assumption and observation, but I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm going to look that up and see if there's research around it. I just, I just see like as we're jumping from ship to ship, I wonder if that's going to impact, you know what I mean? How much we want to yeah. invest in the people. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I think that on the other end, I yeah. see, I, I, you know, I think new to me, I work with a lot of tech VPs and I, yeah. and, I and, you know, I remember this when I, like my dad was a, you know, VP in a, in a bank, you know, they cycle every two to three years. So I'm like, how invested are we? How do you get people invested behind the bigger picture when they feel like that, that leader might churn and they've seen yes. a lot of churn. 
So I feel like, and on the other end as well, it's like if, if any industry, you know, I worked at a company where you were considered a new employee if you still worked there for five years, right? The average tenure were like 12 years. It was the same leaders at the top. I think the CEO had been there 24 years or something I've seen, right? Yeah. And it's like, when he set a direction, everyone's <laughs> going to follow it because he's going to stay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's kind of on both ends. Hmm. I guess the question is how, you know, how can we get people to stay? And yeah, I feel like a lot of companies don't really think about that, but it does yeah. culture. If you're constantly cycling, it's, I mean, I've seen middle layer managers just be like, yeah, I'll wait it out. You know, it's yeah. like, okay. Yeah, no, it's an interesting point. And I, I wonder how we can also bring in like the data into this, right? So I know, I know you're a fan of that. And I know you kind of think about like how, you know, because that's what people want to see is like, where's the data? And where's the numbers? And what's the metrics? Like, uh, some of it is quantifiable, some a lot of it is qualitative in the, the work that we do. But any, what, what are your thoughts on that? And like, how can we use data to help? Yeah, I think that I'm so excited about people operations and how that entire industry is exploding. I think you know this, I have a math degree. And so people are always surprised in interviews, you know, they're like, but you're, you do talent. I'm like, I, yes. And I, I mean, I remember I interviewed, I'm in an MBA program. That's like how I chose. I was in an interview for my master's of org psych and I started asking about the data. I was like, oh, I'm so excited to sit in the rooms and see the data. And they, they were kind of like, oh, I think you'll find that you might be on the like more knowledgeable end, right? And uh, and I remember thinking like, I'm going back to get my MBA because I, you know, they're so data-driven and, the, and now we're seeing people operations explode and I think the insights we'll be able to pull, you know, and I think people are still figuring it out. I'm like really, I'm, I'm obsessed with people operations, like sat in so many of these conversations mm -hmm. and meetings. And I think people are, you know, it's, I think we've moved away from like level one training, right? I think we've always said we can't measure at level four. And I'm like, let's control group it. So I think some of these larger organizations who are really standing up people operations teams, they're going to really start being able to say, here's it, because that's what it is. It's like, we need a control group and we need a non-control group. Mm. And that is super easy to do and to set that up in like a, a safe way, right? Like a, a statistically significant way if you work mm. in a large organization, but you do need that robust engine on the background. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, I'm curious also, like, and I mean, I think as technology evolves and all that, and just like the, just the, the, the ability to capture all these things and to just all the metrics, I think it's going to be super exciting. I'm also curious what it's going to do for the future of work. And I know that's a yeah. topic you feel really passionate about. So any prediction, what would you like to see happen in the world? Like, let's, let's just talk about that. What would I like to see? I mean, I, I, I think I have ideas of what's going to happen. I think at the end of the day, the, I mean, I don't know that. I don't even know that Ethan Pollack could predict what's going to happen, right? And he's like the the AI, like front end yeah. of the AI guy. Um, yeah, I. it'd be interesting. I'm curious what's going to happen to data analysts. You know, right now, I think mm -hmm. it's the people who are, at least I, I I hope that in our lifetime, we get to the people, get to be the people who train it, right? Like there are going to be people who are left behind. I, I remember, this is like, I remember my first job out of college, it was like 22, I, I was sitting in an office and I had been typing on a keyboard since the fourth grade, right? In my fourth grade class, you had to learn how to type with like the right figures and the right letters. And the faster you, the faster you typed, uh, as soon as you were done with the curriculum and you got hundred percent, you could play Oregon Trail, right? So I think I just aged myself, but I'm with the Oregon Trail floppy disk generation. And at 22, I was sitting in an office and I was watching this older woman type with her finger, you know, like this. Yeah. And I don't think anyone does that anymore. I, uh, but I had this, I recognize, and to this day, I'm like, if they're teaching it in fourth grade, you need to learn it. Like that was my takeaway, right? And when coding came out, I was like, I'm gonna learn Python. I don't know that I use Python every day, but I can fit, you know, I know what it means. I, you know, I, I'm pretty eloquent. I Please don't ever make me do it because I'm not, <laughs> the space bar really drives me crazy. And I accidentally put two spaces somewhere. I have to find it, it's terrible. But I think it's the same for AI. Like if, you know, right now is an experimentation, but we've already seen, I mean, there are right like, like there are charts and data around the use. I mean, mm -hmm. it's been around since like 2015, right? But over the last year and a half, you've seen this exponential increase in usage. So it's like, what is it going to do? Nobody knows. But the people who are going to head or be people who are paying attention, mm -hmm. the people who are experimenting with it, the people who are learning it, right? Learning yeah. to wield the power, learning the gaps. I mean, I heard somebody in a meeting just the other day say. Yeah, we should we should just allow our managers to go into ChatGPT and ask for advice. 
And I think it's a really cool inclusion tool because they can say, I'm talking to this person, this age, this is who they are. And I wrote, actually, that's super dangerous because of hallucinogens, right? And because mm -hmm. of who's training the AI, we know that there's problems in the trainers. Yeah. We know that, you know, if, if, you know, white tech workers are training the AI, then that's what it's going to push out. So it's like a very dangerous game to play right now. Uh, so I, I think like people who know that are going to be the people who get ahead, right? In this yeah. industry, what's it going to look like? I mean, I don't know. We, you know, I think we're still working on the flying car. So and that being <laughs> said, I can, you know, I think as a kid, the idea that I could see the person on the phone was a dream. Yeah. Right? So who knows? Like might be there, might not be. It's, yeah. You know. Yeah. I was talking to my dad the other day when we were on, on, on a uh, WhatsApp uh, video call. And and he was like he always like brings this up you know he's a, he's he's sixty four sixty three one, uh, one of those and uh, he was like he's always amazed you know he's like he's always amazed and he's like the guy who just like we just forced him to get like an iPhone like maybe two years ago before that yeah. he was just like I don't know you know like and then we're like no 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 you needed to like talk to us like that's what, he's such an old school traditional Russian guy like he's just like I don't need this you know but he's always amazed like every time we talk he's just like it's just so amazing. I was like, I know I've been telling you for years to get an iPhone so we can, you know, or like some kind of smartphone, you know, before he was just using like, like a regular flip phone or something, just because he just refused. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it's very, very interesting to observe. Um, yeah. You know what, what's um, another thing that comes up as well is I was chatting with somebody on my podcast and um, this, this gentleman leads a group um, called 40 plus in DC. So basically they're just kind of working with uh, more senior experienced professionals like 40 plus um uh that are Aren't you know 40 the new senior this is concerning uh, well you know i mean that's it but I, I mean not 40 i mean i'm i'm i'm, I'm pushing 40 as well soon in, in a few <laughs> years but uh the population more like 50 55 plus but it's anybody it's open to anybody 40 plus yeah, yeah, yeah. you know but it's 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 they're they're slightly i mean senior in terms of experience that's what i meant no oh, i like that that's much better that's, no, no, that's why that, that senior number, experience. thank you for, for, yeah senior experience not a senior <laughs> person i think i mean listen i'm all up for 40s okay i I'm, I'm 37 and i cannot wait for 40s i feel like life begins at 40 you know etc <laughs> so i'm super yeah i think it's super young but a more experienced people that yeah. still suffer that ageism in the workplace. So 40 is usually at yeah, 40, 45, but after 50, I think people start to feel it. And I see this with some clients mm. I work with and just, and I'm in talent acquisition. And so I see, I, I see these kind of challenges and I'm just curious, you know, with all this tech coming out and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit worried. I mean, and, and not worried, but it's like, there's a lot of great talent. And I, I wonder if we as companies overlook that talent because of the age you know or because oh, you know you know what i mean wow. and it's um and uh, yeah and it's just with technology and i wonder if that gap is going to grow you know like more and more I, I don't know it's just i i worry for that right because there's still a lot of really um there's a lot of people in that age group you know and i feel wow. like it, like right now in the market there's just a lot of them looking for work and it's kind of disheartening because you're like well you know they bring so much value but i wonder if we even know how to recognize that value when we're so focused on like the do they know the tech? You know what yeah. I mean? So. You know, I wonder if that's going to change because I feel like we're of the generation, right? Like Facebook came out in our lives, right? This idea that 20 year olds, I mean, I remember, I don't, I don't think I was even 30 yet when they said 35, like, their, Facebook wasn't hiring over 35, right? I mean, that, that whole group is in their forties now. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if some of those leaders will have epiphanies and, you know, and they say like the average successful startup founder is over 40. Yeah. Right. So I think we idolize these one or two. And I mean, maybe I could let these people build a future, right? Like that, but we idolize them. And it's like, well, comparatively, like, okay, yeah, there's always going to be the unicorns, but there's all these other startup founders who have made multi-million dollar companies. Maybe they're not as sexy as Facebook, but you don't even know you're using them, right? Because they're mm -hmm. back end engineering or they're back end of some product. Yeah. So maybe that discrimination will change. But I I yeah, I agree with you. I think it's, I mean, I remember. I think I was 28 and I had a colleague who was 57. He had just pivoted out of being a teacher into our industry. And, you know, so he was technically retired. He had retired from one industry. And I remember we were, we were meeting at his house for a meeting and he had, uh, his house was just, it was more tech, tech advanced than my own home. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. everything was connected to an app. I mean, the iPhone was still relatively new. He was so excited. I mean, he had, he was so knowledgeable about his, you know, his, 
uh, I thought I was knowledgeable at that point around like, uh, you know, using my Apple computer and he just blew me away. And I was like, and I was like, man, and like, if somebody didn't connect with him, you might not know that because he's not going to show it off. He doesn't care. Right. He's much more like, stable in himself, comfortable in himself, mm-hmm. you know, no frills, no BS kind of guy. Uh, yeah. And he was incredibly, incredibly intelligent, brought up an incredible amount of wisdom, easy, but I agree with you, easy to overlook. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, and on the, on the other aspect of all of this, another issue that I feel is not discussed enough and I, it's also worrying me. Um, and I'm doing a lot of research around that because, you know, my, I, I love the, the whole young talent pipeline uh, uh, story, but less and less young men are entering the workforce. So oh, I don't have, so, so I don't know if you've, you've heard the numbers, oh. but so, uh, so basically uh, the number from 1980s to today, it dropped the, the involvement of young men between ages of 18 and 40 has dropped like something like 15 to 20%, meaning that 20% less men are entering the workforce and they're not going to the gig economy, all that. These are the people that are particularly 18 to like early 30s in particular. They are completely checking out of the workforce. They are either just, you know, um, you know, just not, you know, either living off of their parents or just doing some, some, some small jobs to kind of just feed themselves and so on. But they're not really involved in um, building a career having that solid job, um, less men compared to women are also attending universities before it was like, uh, you know, 40% women, 60% men. Now it's flipped. Uh, so more women are attending universities, more women are growing their careers than men. So because, and and I was talking to somebody else on my podcast about this that day, and they said, it's almost like in this, in this diversity and equity for women, we somehow left this whole young male generation behind. Oh yeah. And, and there's a lot of stats or you'd be interested to learn about that as well, but there's yeah. a lot of research about it. And it's, it's, it's very scary because there's a whole societal issue that goes into that. Um, but, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a thing that's happening. And, you know, obviously uh, young generations are more depressed, more lonely and all yeah. of that. So it's like, what does that all look like in the future of work, especially if they're pushing for remote work for the, especially for the young yeah. ones. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not good though. It's not all good, you know? Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see the long term data of how that, like, what happens, where do they go, how yeah. does that impact society, or maybe they haven't figured out. You know, like I, you know, I wasn't a career woman. I mean, at twenty three, I was working at Outward Bound. I loved it, right? I mean, now it's a career because it led to experiential education. But I traveled the world in my twenties, right? Like I connected jobs. I love. I mean, I loved my career, but I don't think I called it a career when I first signed up, right? I said I'll do it for a summer. And then I lived in Cambodia for a year and was like, okay, I'll come back and do it again. Okay. I'll do it more in deep. Cause I really love it. And just kind of kept following this, the, the breadcrumbs and figured out like the energy, what do I love? But who knows? I mean, the other end of that is maybe, maybe that actually helps us become a better society. Cause I, I, you know, I meet people, I feel really lucky, right? Like I, I think I started taking my career seriously around like 28, uh, but I meet in my career now, 35 year olds who you know, I know who I am. I'm really confident. I'm, mm. I think I'm less afraid of what's going to happen because I feel really confident about my skills. I've experienced adversity, right? I've, I've experienced resiliency that comes from just, you know, being a global, I mean, a female traveler in your twenties. Right. Mm. And so perhaps I feel more at peace. I'm more, more culturally yeah. confident. Like when we think about, you know, going back to your asking questions, I imagine you and I ask a lot of questions because we come from two cultures, yeah. right? And so I don't think my American culture, my Russian culture was right. I think they're different. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I feel like I do a lot, of, did a lot of cultural translating. And so maybe these young men will have those experiences to bring into the workforce in 10 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's I, the hope, hope, right? I'm like an I, I, optimistic I, at, at heart. I, I'm so pessimistic. I, I love it because <laughs> I need somebody optimistic in my life. I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm also like, I'm just kind of like, yeah, uh, because I don't think they're spending time traveling. I think the, the at least the data that was shown in that report, yeah. I'll, I'll include it in the show notes as well, but yeah, yeah. it was talking about that they're spending 2000 hours on average in front of TV screens and computer oh, yeah. screens and okay. video games and all of that. Um, so it's a lot of that. We're having less children. Men are general having uh, less uh, partners, like less female interactions with, with, with you know, uh, their like relationships in general. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, so it's like it's it's, it's all down, they're going downhill, according to this data, at least. And that's why it's concerning that nobody's talking about it. Only a, like a handful of people that have heard talk about this topic. 
Um, but yeah, so I hope that they're coming in. But as a recruiter, I'm just thinking like somebody who deals with talent, like if you're showing up on my screen, you know, on my on in my pathway as a recruiter, you know, and you're late 20s, early 30s, and you don't have much to show, you know what I mean? And you are, you know, born and raised in America, especially if you're living in a specific area, that's a red flag for me. Because, you know, there are a lot of opportunities here, you know, so it's like, if you haven't done something, if you travel the world, beautiful, sign me up, you know, I'm all, I'm all on board for that. But I, I just wonder what it looks like future wise, like if that's the trend, it's not going to look good five, 10 years from now. That's, that's the scary part. Yeah, I I mean, send me the research. I'd be, I'd be curious and I could talk offline a lot about this, but in, in a most pessimistic state, I'll tell you, Tony Robbins, I had the privilege of seeing him live at Silicon Slopes last month. And he, mm. he had a really interesting take on society. Like we say things like this is the best or this is the worst. And it's like, and he showed actually generationally over like 20 to 30 years, how we, how we just cycle, mm. right? So what we're talking about now, like young men out of work, young men being like what we call TV time is lazy, right? Like being lazy. Yeah. This was a lot of the men in the thirties, right? That was happening all over the place. There were no jobs. People were moving to cities because there were no jobs. And then there was, there was a war, right? And so his mm. whole take was like, um, hard people make, uh, hard people make soft kids, soft kids make bad societies, bad societies make hard people. Yeah. And just, yeah, he was showing sure. how like, like I, since the beginning of time, I mean, I think he started in the United States, like the early, you know, the, the early 1900s, but yeah. uh, like, are these, you know, we're, I mean, we're heading into a, we're heading, we're in a war, we're yeah. multiple wars. Yeah. And I think we've yeah. been in, I mean, our generation has been in war forever, but so. where, you know, is what's going to happen there? And are those, you know, are those hard, they're going to be hard men, right. Mm -hmm. Who are going to go through a tough society. And then I hope, I mean, I, I mean, according to Tony Robbins, you know, by the time we're in our sixties, it'll be a soft generation for us. <laughs> yeah. By the time our kids and grandkids <laughs> come about. Really good. So oh, I don't know, it was nice. Cause I do think there's a, the way, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of incentives to keep us in a state of fear. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. that idea of it's really bad. It's like, well, it's, it's always, there's always been a bad time and it leads to a, yeah. a hard time. It leads to a good time. Yeah. The question is, and it goes back to the AI is, are you ready? Mm. Okay. Like there's going to be people who are ready and there are people who are not ready. And there's going to be people who are diamonds on the rough who crack and shine and there mm. will be people left behind. That's like what history shows yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a much like positive. Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> that's a much positive note to, to, to wrap this up on. Let's before, before my pessimistic <laughs> self comes in, um, where can people find you? Where do you hang out? Cause I know you're super active on LinkedIn and you post amazing oh, yeah. stuff. So yeah. is there anywhere else? So is like LinkedIn is your main thing. LinkedIn is my thing. Look, I'm a, I'm a working woman in school with a child. I'm like barely <laughs> keeping the LinkedIn thing together. Uh, yeah, I'm always available. Like people can reach out. I have my website, right? It's olgafeingold.com. Uh, I'm, I, I love to talk about this stuff. I can't talk about it enough. And to your point, I'm remote. So I spend an obscene amount of hours on the computer. So if, if you're traveling through Utah, I live in Salt Lake city and that's new. So I'd that's love awesome. to meet people. Yeah. Amazing. And the last question I ask all of my guests, and you have already kind of pinpointed a few, so you can re recycle those if you want, because they were all great. But what is one question you wish people would ask themselves more often? Mm, what brings me joy? Mm. You know, like I think when we talked about like, it's gonna, it's hard, there's a generation that's hard, those people are going to create hard times, it's hard for them, you know, whatever age you're at, it, life is short, you know, and if the pandemic hasn't taught you anything, it's that nothing is guaranteed. Everything can change. And as far as we know, right, this is our one true life that we will remember. Mm -hmm. And so I can like choose joy, you know, mm -hmm. that's not mine. That's, I think I just do want to accolade that. Uh, that's from the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And I got like teary eyed because I mean, he's a man through went through apartheid. Mm -hmm. Right. And he, ch he chooses joy. He wakes up and chooses joy. And, or he did wake up and choose joy. And I think that that was a really interesting life lesson for me around like how giggly someone could be who had experienced tougher times than I think we can imagine. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Well, I appreciate you and thank you for the work that you're doing and the, the the optimism and joy you're spreading. And, and uh, I love that. And thank you again for making the time for this. Oh my God, thank you for this conversation. I could do this all day with you. So thank you. <laughs>